Okay, I want to spend today talking about pelvic floor health. What is the pelvic floor uh, ways that we can be sure that we're not aggravating or creating more stressful uh, situations or environments for our pelvic floor? I want to start by quickly prefacing that this is not medical advice. I do not, uh, I am not giving medical advice. All I am doing is imparting my wisdom, uh, my teachings, what I have learned, what I have found that has worked with me and the, the thousands of people that I've worked with to help uh, get you a, a little bit, to help you reclaim a little bit more control and a, a more uh, abundant, rich, nourishing relationship with your body. Okay, so I wanted to talk about pelvic floor because you might have heard of it or you might not have heard of it and how pelvic floor is essentially the foundation for uh, long-term health and how when we're talking with individuals, how when I'm talking with individuals where anybody is developing an exercise, healing, physical therapy, uh, sports performance program, why you really want to prioritize the pelvic floor. So your, your pelvic floor is essentially a group of muscles. It's like a hammock, okay? It hangs like a hammock, like a trampoline, uh, pretty much between your, your sex, so your genitals, and your anus, all right? So it goes essentially front to back from my pubic bone to my tailbone, okay? So that's one of the, way, one of the directions of the pelvic floor. Then it goes on the inside of the, um, the ischial tuberosity, which is your sit bones, and it goes across to kind of create that horizontal hammock. So we have a vertical hammock, we have a horizontal hammock, and then we have another kind of horizontal hammock, which is across, um, the ischial spines, which are these little bony landmarks um, at the top of the sit bones, at the back of the, the ilium, which is the, the pelvic bone. Uh, so basically we have pelvic floor. Okay, what is it and, and, and what it is not? It is not something that only women have. I, I've actually had this conversation with lots of men in my life, uh, typically older men, but also young men that, uh, well, women have pelvic floors. And, and I have to just correct this by saying we all have pelvic floor muscles. Now, one of the things that is kind of unique about pelvic floor is it seems taboo to talk about because we're talking about such an intimate, um, emotionally triggering part of the body. Like when we think about sex, sex organs, genitals, and things like that, it brings up a lot of uh, discomfort typically in conversation. And, and so this is one of the reasons like pelvic floor is only really coming into the, the spotlight in the therapy world. Maybe the past five, 10 years, I, I could probably, somebody could argue that it's been around a lot more, maybe like 20, 30 years but it was in really small uh, niche groups of people, like little enclaves of individuals, uh, body workers, body therapists, manual therapists, and the like. So why do we wanna talk about pelvic floor is like um, we have to train and condition and nourish and take care of our pelvic floor just like any other body, uh, muscle in the body. The diaphragm, the bicep, the hamstring, the quad, the glute max, transverse abdominis, the, the pecs, the lats, the, the rhomboids, we have, we have, I think, over like 600 or 800 muscles, which again, bear with me, they're just names of, bot, um, they're just names of tissues, okay? But we have to treat the pelvic floor with tremendous respect and care and attention and mindfulness because it is the foundation of the body, okay? The fact that it's the hammock underneath your pelvis, um, we want that to almost be like a, a light bulb going off in your head, like, wow, that seems really important. It's the foundation of my, my structure. It, think of it as like a foundation to a house. If you don't have a floor, somebody might say, well, you have ground. But, but if you don't have ground, you don't have anything. You can't really build a sturdy foundation on something that is um, not supportive, not adaptable, uh, not durable, and, uh, or strong, okay? So, so pelvic floor is, is a foundational part of the body that uh, connects underneath the pelvis, front to back and side to side, all right? Um, it has a lot of different jobs involved in the excrement of, of bodily fluids. Um, it also is involved with uh, things like uh, the bladder, like it supports the organs, okay? So if you imagine your bladder kind of sits on top of your pelvic bowl, uh, your, and then your pelvic floor is underneath the pelvic bowl, 
And then with your bladder, you have the small intestines, the large intestines, the stomach, the liver, the gallbladder, the pancreas. You have all the different organs kind of smushed into what's called the, um, you have the abdominal cavity up here, which is a little bit more like your, your liver, your stomach, maybe some of the, the transverse colon, some of the intestines. But then you have the pelvic cavity, okay, which is going to be a little bit lower than the abdominal cavity. And that's going to be your bladder. Uh, your kidneys are sometimes considered part of the, uh, the pelvic bowl and, and the light. So, so one of the reasons we really want to take care of the pelvic floor and be sure that we're not creating additional stress on it is because if our foundation falls apart or is constantly being um, like overly contracted, okay, so it's always kind of squeezing and tensing up, um, or on the opposite end, if it's kind of underactive, like there's, there's, no, there's not enough circulation, blood flow, and awareness going to it, that can start to get us into a uh, kind of a complicated conundrum because pain will manifest in the body in different ways. So you might actually start to experience uh, shoulder, low back, hip, knee, ankle pain, uh, all because the pelvic floor has lost its elasticity, its recoil, okay? Because if we think about a muscle, we want a muscle to be able to lengthen eccentrically and then snap short concentrically, okay? To me, that is the sign of healthy tissue. It's one of the many signs of healthy tissue. It tells me that it's, it's hydrated, um, it has vi viscous properties to it, uh, and when a, a muscle is able to move through its entire range uh, or length, tank, uh, length tension relationship, it can then assist in moving the joints through their entire excursions of motion. An excursion of motion being, uh, you know, a shoulder joint going all, all the way through its designated and uh, designed range and then coming back out of it. So it's the same thing with the pelvic floor. Now, one of the reasons pelvic floor doesn't get a lot of attention in the exercise world, and it has more of a place for the, the rehabilitative therapy and the therapeutic world, is because it's not a muscle that you can necessarily feel as easily as something like a bicep. I can't just put a weight somewhere on my body, lift it up and say, pelvic floor, do you feel that pelvic floor? Um, so it usually involves kind of quieting down uh, doing some of that lying down work I was talking about uh, in one of my other videos. And, and it involves uh, a, a, s a more subtle, softer, gentler approach to bring the awareness into the picture. Now, awareness is the precursor of action. Okay, so we have to build an awareness of something before we can take actionable steps in that direction. Okay, in order to aim at something and go on that path, First, we have to have a sense and an awareness that it even exists, okay? So what, one of the things about the pelvic floor is it, it can be tough to feel or figure out on your own. And this is why a lot of people work with trainers, uh, manual therapists, body workers, basically to learn new things about their bodies and what most people don't know about is the pelvic floor. Now, the other thing is the pelvic floor is also referred to as the pelvic diaphragm. Okay, so people sometimes think diaphragm, that's your breathing muscle, and it's people like kind of tap their chest, and they're like somewhere in the chest, right? We do. We have a respiratory um, thoracic diaphragm that sits on, at the under part of our rib cage, and it's a three-dimensional uh, three-dimensional triplanar muscle. Uh, but the pelvic diaphragm, okay, it sits in opposition of the, the thoracic diaphragm, and we actually want the two diaphragms working, working together. So when we breathe in, we want our thoracic diaphragm to drop down. We want our pelvic diaphragm to lengthen and to kind of sink so the organs all push down. And then when we exhale, we want everything to go back up. So when, when it comes to, to breath work and breathing, um, the pelvic floor is not just... The pelvic floor is not just a group of muscles or a set of muscles that we have to think about uh, strengthening and educating and taking care of. It actually has a lot to do with our breath. Okay, so, so a lot of times if we are chronic neck breathers, chest breathers, uh, it might be that we're not getting enough 
um, pelvic breathing to occur in our respiration cycles. Uh, and then the other thing that's, that's, uh, that I think is unique about the pelvic floor is the fact that it has such deep ties to our, our lower extremities, which then affect our upper extremities. So a lot of the pelvic floor muscles, their innervations, the nerve roots that go to those tissues, uh, come from the sacrum, the sacrum and maybe like L4, L5, so the base of the spine. And, and uh, in addition to that, a lot of the, the smaller hip muscles that we need for pelvic stability, that we need for uh, support on one leg as we take a walk through life or perform a physical activity is like a lot of these muscles might as well be grouped together as one. Like, like pelvic floor assists in hip stability. Pelvic floor health has a direct correlation to hip power, uh, leg strength, leg power, like these things that people search for when we uh, exercise, when we decide to exercise, pelvic floor actually has a direct relationship with. So we think about strengthening our legs. Some people might even think about strengthening their hips. Typically you hear about people like strengthening their legs, their, their back and their core. Um, but, but if I want to really develop a durable uh, lower body that is capable of withstanding high amounts of stress at a variety of speeds, okay, whether I'm walking in the world or I'm jumping uh, onto a ledge or I'm jumping, uh, you know, down into a hole or, you know, just leaping from a wall onto the floor, uh, kicking a soccer ball, jumping, uh, doing a layup, doing a golf swing, there, there's an infinite amount of motions that we do with our hips and pelvis that, uh, that the pelvic floor actually has a pretty big role in. But again, we don't talk about it because the, the sexual area of the body is, it's like charged, it's emotionally and electrically charged. So we don't, we don't um, have regular conversations with other trainers or therapists about it because it immediately brings up our own pasts and our associations with our sex and sex as a topic of discussion. Um, the reason we want to be sure that we hone our, our training practice in and make sure that we are addressing pelvic floor health is because it is, I, I said this at the beginning, it is foundational to keeping your body uplifted on itself. It is a part of what's called your anti-gravity system, which is going to keep unnecessary compression off of your joints. Um, I've seen people, when they improve the tone and elastic recoil of their pelvic floor and they start to regain some of their, their control and consciousness of their pelvic floor region, they improve their hip mobility, their low back, uh, their low back pain, like they'll get more low back decompression, decompression, their thoracic spine will start to open up, their ribs will begin to move a little bit more because as you move the pelvic floor, you have to think that you're also directly influencing the thoracic diaphragm, okay? So, uh, so anyway, a couple ideas to stimulate your pelvic floor is to do more things barefoot, okay? The tissues on the bottom of your feet uh, directly, if you think about it, it's just one big muscle. The tissues on, in my toes and bottom of my feet, they go right up to the under part of my groin and pelvis. So that's going to start to send signals to my, my pelvic floor. Another simple thing is to lie down, put your legs up on an ottoman or the sofa so that they're bent 90 degrees. Just lie down and see if you can, you can breathe, uh, you know, and you can, you can track your breath. So follow your breath down your neck, down your chest, see if you can feel it in your belly. And over time, there are specific exercises that you can do while doing your breathing exercises to start to bring blood flow and awareness to the pelvic floor. Um, two other things I really like is, so from an, uh, an energy chakra, Eastern medicine perspective, pelvic floor is associated with root. So it's the roots, the foundation, um, and, and, uh, singing. So that's why I want to say singing can be stimulating to the pelvic floor. It can help build that awareness, specifically low tones. You want to be able to sing, chant these low, drawn out tones. And, and you can look all over the internet for ways to lower your resonance, 
All right, so we're basically bringing vibration at a very subtle level to the tailbone and the base of the spine. Uh, one of the last things I really love about the pelvic floor, that, or I love to tell people about the pelvic floor, is um, dance, all right? Especially men. Like, like um, men don't typically have a lot of hip uh, mobility, hip sway. Uh, their pelvic floors tend to get really like kind of clenched and tight and stuck in one position. I would tell people to start just like finding a little bit of rhythm in their home, playing music and just moving around. I have a one and a half year old, so I'm, I'm constantly dancing with him, bouncing, and basically encouraging movement everywhere between your belly button and your pubic bone, okay? So just like letting your hips sway side to side is a, is a healthy practice for that. What I would say to somebody if they're overly flexible and they say, I dance all the time, I can hit all the low, low keys, um, you also have to put some restraints around flexibility because a lot of people, you can also have a, a, a pelvic floor that's almost like too much, too open. It needs to learn how to close a little bit. So, so to that, I, I would say maybe you need to like get away from dancing and like learn how to like strengthen your pelvis in really specific positions. The last thing I'll throw in is maybe you've been taught about Kegels as a woman or as a man, you know, this idea of like kind of sucking and pulling up your, your pelvic floor. And typically, this is a more advanced technique that has a, an intentional role in somebody's physical practice later on. A lot of people, because of modern lifestyle, they don't need to be learning to clench, okay? Um, we clench because of lifestyle, because of technology, modern conveniences. We've got to develop uh, a method, a technique for shutting off the brain putting our concentration into shutting off, dropping in, hearing, feeling, experiencing our breath. And this is going to be one of the, the key ways to assure that you can train, uh, you know, you can train, you can exercise, you can do physical tasks, you can withstand stress of all kinds for the rest of your life in a sustainable manner. So again, I, I want to remind you that if you're interested in the, the study and the practice of longevity training and using sustainable practices over a long period of time uh, and building your body in a way that supports you every day so that you feel like you're adaptable, able-bodied, and capable, you got to start from the, the floor up. And in this case, it's going to be pelvic floor awareness and the bottoms of your feet, and maybe next time I'll talk about the feet. Uh, thanks so much, drop comments, send me messages if you have questions. I know I'm not giving out exercises, that's really not the intention of these videos. I'm trying to get content out there and try to explain to people why things have a place uh, in the grand scheme of the universe and our day-to-day -day lives. Thanks.